filled with fancy camp furniture. And then you realize that you didn't have the money or the skill or the time to make all those things work. And then as you got older, uh, or if you're just starting out, when you get older, you realize that you have the money and maybe even the time, but you don't have the energy to set that kind of thing up. Uh, also, you don't own a semi. And so it's hard to bring all that stuff with you. So I am happy to tell you, my friends, your far-fetched fantasies are not flights of fancy. You can, in fact, do these things. When I build for the SDA, I have a number of principles in mind. I start with beauty because that's the most important thing to me. After that, I'm looking for lightweight, strong, easy to transport, and no removable, uh, no removable parts if I can help it, at least the fewest number of removable parts that I can do. If I build a joint, a woodworking joint, it's Oregon, one never knows, and that joint is permanent, I want that joint to be very, very strong. If that joint is not going to be permanent, I want it to be hinged, or I want it to lock together without any extra parts. And we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get into joinery. Does anybody have any questions at this point? Cool. So uh, when we look at typical people, okay, so I'm gonna want some uh, audience participation for this part, so get ready to hit your microphones. Uh, when people generally build for the SCA, what are the woodworking materials that they use? Wall wood, wood and two by fours. That's right. Yeah. Primarily, yes, you're correct with wood. Primarily, we're seeing construction material. And because, so this has some, some drawbacks. It's got some benefits, it's got some drawbacks. A uh, two by four, which is generally made of fir or pine, depending on where you're at, is relatively stable. It's in um, regular dimensions. So you know what you need when you're building. You don't have to mill it down at all. And it used to be relatively easy to find. After decades of mismanagement coming in together with the COVID virus, the cost of a two by four has absolutely skyrocketed. Uh, I think an eight foot two by four I saw the other day for 10 or $12. It was like $3 just a couple of years ago. A four by eight shade of plywood somebody posted was $100 and it was $30 just a few years ago. And that's fine because these are not great materials for what we're doing. First off, they are two by fours and instantly recognizable as two by fours from anywhere. Second off, they're not particularly stable in use. They don't weather pretty very well. They're not particularly strong versus deflection bending. So if you've got a ridge pole made out of a two by four, you'll notice over not very long, it'll start to sag and bend. And if you're not taking care of it, oiling it or putting on some kind of finish, it'll get weak and eventually it'll crack. And they're very, very heavy for what they are. I, I use, if I'm going to do something like that, my go-to is poplar. And I have a piece of poplar just off screen here. Here we go. So poplar is a lightweight material. Um, it is very, very soft. It paints, it stains, it screws, it nails, it mills, it turns. Um, it's really fun, you can carve it, it's really fun to work with. It's not particularly shock resistant. So if you're gonna uh, build something that's gonna take some kind of shock force, this is not the one to use. And you're gonna have to either buy it pre-milled or mill it yourself. Uh, another go-to material that people use is uh, not so much, we're going to strand board, but do I really not have any? Well, I'll tell you how often I use it. Uh, three quarter inch, oh, here's some. Some three quarter inch plywood. I don't know if you can see that or not. Everybody knows what three quarter inch plywood looks like. It's heavy. It's stupidly heavy. 
and you don't need that much strength. You can get away with uh, Baltic birch plywood, which doesn't have the voids. It's a much finer quality wood. And while it is heavier per square foot for what you're doing, it's also much, much stronger. And it comes in five by five foot sheets for a reason which I'm not entirely certain of. If you can get it, Port Orchard Cedar is amazing. It smells fantastic. It is rot resistant. Uh, it's ultra, ultra lightweight. It is, or at least it was, produced here in the Pacific Northwest, which means it's a little cheaper. Uh, it is a very expensive wood, but if you're paying what you're paying for a two by four, then Port Orchard's not that much more and it's gonna last forever. What was that called again? Port type Orchard Cedar, which uh, strangely enough is not actually a cedar. It smells like cedar, so that's what it got called. It's actually a cypress and cypress is well known for being rot and bug resistant. Another one is Moranti. Uh, sometimes this is called Luan or Philippine mahogany. It's relatively lightweight. It's beautiful. This is the natural color of the wood. I don't know how well you can see it. Um, I've got a little oil on this side. So it's kind of a reddish wood. Do I have any? I don't have anything that's, that's been stained. Um, and then of course, for sheet goods, my favorite is eight inch Luan. This stuff is cheap. Uh, I think it's still under 20 bucks a sheet and it's lightweight. If we're talking about period materials, oh, here's a, here's a question before I get into that. Does anybody know the difference between hardwood and softwood? What it actually means? I'll give you the hint. It's not to do with the hardness of the material how long it takes the tree to grow. The hardwoods have a longer time to expand. It takes more years for it to grow. Um, so the, the density of the cells is harder. Typically that is true. Uh, it's not always true and it's not necessarily what those terminologies refer to. Does anybody else have a guess? The hardwoods lose their leaves in the winter. There it is. And the other ones are evergreens. That is true. Softwoods are needle bearing trees. Hardwoods are deciduous trees or broadleaf trees, I guess is the, the term now. Uh, fir is remarkably hard, but it is a softwood. I think balsa is actually a hardwood. I'm not positive on that. Where was I? Oh, hardwoods in period. Uh, so if we're look, talking about period things and I say hardwood, what is the wood that comes to mind? Oak. oak. It is oak. Oak always comes to mind. Oak is a pain in the ass to work with. It, uh, I was, the shop was intended originally to do craftsman style furniture, which is almost always out of white oak. Turns out that I'm allergic to the tannin and it gives me a tremendous headache anytime I run a, an oak board through the table saw. It is hard to carve unless you are a gifted and skilled carver. It is very difficult to carve. It's very, very heavy. It's strong, but it doesn't give you as much strength as, as it's worth. If you were going to use, if, if you needed to build something and you needed it to look like oak, I would strongly suggest ash. Ash is uh, a very similar looking wood to a layperson. They're not gonna tell the difference. Uh, it's just as heavy. It's even stronger. Ash is what they use for Oh, I get these confused. It's either baseball bats or ax handles. I think it's baseball bats. And the other, uh, the, other is, the other uses hickory. The reason for that is that ash and hickory are both shock resistant. Oak is not, it'll break. The biggest difference though, is that ash is considerably cheaper than oak, at least it is here. Softwoods, in softwoods, we're looking at pine, but the thing is that the woods that they use then just don't exist anymore. The, those are virgin forests and the cellular structure of the wood is, you just can't get it anymore unless you are getting uh, wood that has been reclaimed from the Great Lakes. And if anybody wants to buy anything for my birthday coming up in a few weeks, 30, 40 board feet of uh, Great Lakes timber would be great. 
I wouldn't mind. I'll find a place for it. So we've talked about materials. So now we're looking at design. And when I look at design, when I am designing, I am thinking about transportation. I'm thinking about weight. I'm thinking about storage on and off site. I'm thinking about the fact that it's going to be out in the weather and it's going to be on uneven ground, which means it's going to take a tremendous amount of racking, which is twisting. Um, and I have to plan for all of those. Um, an excellent example of where that those forces really all come together is a camp bed. Rope beds are very romantic and they look great and they are not comfortable. It's like sleeping inside a tostada, especially if you've got um, a mattress that is like a futon or an air mattress or a, God help you if you're on a feather bed. There are ways to get around that, but really, if you're just looking for the look of it, use knockdown joinery uh, for the, the bed itself and then put slats underneath. And then just to fake rope on the side, no one will notice the difference. It'll look great from right up close and you won't sleep like you're inside a walk. For building um, something like a tabletop that's going to be heavy, what I suggest is something called a torsion box. Uh, a torsion box, a really common example of those are hollow core doors. Everybody's, I'm sure, opened a door that weighs nothing. Inside that door, what you have is a wooden frame that goes around all four sides, and then uh, cardboard, usually, that's honeycomb all inside, and then two skins on either side of the door. By the way, if you've got a door like that that's got a big hole punched into it, you can buy door skins. It's just eight inch lumber already cut to almost the right size, and you just glue it on, and that hole is gone. Make sure that your door will still shut, though, because that's important. The torsion box gets rid of solid material uh, by putting an internal structure that's all glued and nailed screwed down and gives tremendous strength, tremendous stability, and very, very lightweight. It's kind of junky when you're closing a hollow core door. You really can't get angry and slam a hollow core door. Those big, heavy doors, if you want to get angry and really show that you don't have control of your emotions, Solid door is the way you want to go. But if you're packing for an event, solid is probably not your best choice. And the, oh yes, no removable parts. This is a big one. Every nut and bolt that you have to put together on site, you're looking at about five minutes. And five minutes doesn't seem like that long. First off, it doesn't seem like it would take five minutes to screw a nut and bolt together, but it's not just screw the nut and bolt together. It's find the nut and bolt, put the bolt through, align the parts, put the bolt through again, find the nut, drop the nut, find the nut in the grasp, pick up the nut, put it back on, find your tools, get it on, get it tight, and then replace, repeat that whole process again and again and again and again. Much better to use uh, joinery that just doesn't come apart. I'll tell you what, I'm gonna knock up a quick little model for you. This may or may not be loud, so we'll see what happens. Let's see. Let's see if I can move this so you can actually see what I'm doing.
thank you for bearing with that. Oh, I need. Just other... sitting here. You're the one running around a shop doing things. <laughs> well, I, I know this isn't the uh, the most exciting thing to watch. I probably need to run into the house again and grab some super glue to make this a useful demonstration. Would you like me to tell them how new of a transplant you are? <laughs> and how different that shop looks since I saw it last? What's that? And how different that shop looks since I saw it last? Well, there was no light in here. <laughs> she, she just moved into the, this, uh, this house and uh, has fixed up the reassembled all of her equipment for for this demonstration. She's had all of these tools for a very long time as a talented craftswoman, but getting the the flow of your space, especially for for cranking out different projects, is always really useful to have your space oriented optimally. And especially when moving spaces, that moment of there's no outlet. I will be right back. I've got to go grab some glue. There's just literally no outlets or lights or switches anywhere. So I know she rigged up that outlet there, a couple more outlets like the last couple of days and uh, reoriented stuff for, for this to, to demonstrate for y'all and get some things going. So bear with her for a second because those moments of which box is the glue in? <laughs> Where is that saw? Uh-oh. Especially that moment of, where is that sample of that Luan or that Birch or whatever? Okay, let's, let's build a bed or a little model of the bed. Oh, uh, let's see, how do I want to do this? See if I can get my camera to do what it's supposed to do. Oh, come on. There we go. All right. Can everybody see? Looks yep, great. Looks good. Good, good. Okay. Actually, I'll do it this and use the bad side. Okay, so everybody knows that to have a really sexy camp, you've got to have a platform bed of some kind, right? Say yes. It helps. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Sexy, sexy. Definitely need that sexy bed. That's what I'm saying. That is what I'm saying to you right now. You're going to have to ignore the tape. This is what we're using for hinges. Now I'll just hope that the glue sticks to the tape too. So what I want to do is build something called a uh, parallel. Uh, we use these in theater a lot to build risers. You want um, to be able to lift the 
actor or the set piece in the air a bit, but you also want to be able to store that stuff later on. And you don't want anything to get lost along the way, which it absolutely will. Am I, am I in the frame? Good, good. I am. Okay, so I got my two long sides, which are not straight, but that's okay. I can hear you, Krista. How can you hear through the mute? <laughs> that's not fair. <laughs> Okay, I'm in California. That's very far away. How are you doing that supersonic ears? I was just thinking of the Woodwrights dude where he'd be like, oh, it's fine. We're just doing a little demonstration. It's all right. She's talking about Roy Underhill from the Woodwright shop. And so she has uh, successfully identified my first shout out. All right. Now, one more. And hopefully this works. Otherwise, I will learn why you should Practice things before you start. Uh, also, I can see that my saw is not squared, which makes me grumpy. Okay. Where are we at? There we go. This is how it would transport. And then when you get to site, all that is required is that. And hinges that are not made out of masking tape. Then uh, I don't have an easy piece candy, but you put a piece of, of plywood. No, I don't have anything larger. You just set a piece of ply on top of that. You probably need a second brace in the, or a third brace rather in the middle, but it will always just close parallel, be relatively lightweight, easy to carry, and easy to stow in a vehicle. If you needed one that stowed up even smaller, then the way to do it is something called a continental parallel. My tape hinges are not working. Uh, and a continental parallel bisects this piece and this piece. So they fold inward and these two pieces just close right together, which means it's never going to be longer than the longest length of the bed. And there is no weak spot in the hinges uh, where it would if you're if you're if your legs hinged out um, and no removable parts. So you get to site you turn it and you're done. And there's enough play in the hinges that even if the ground is uneven, it'll be easy to, uh, it'll, it'll wobble a bit without hurting it. So that is called a parallel. All right, well, how about we build a chest in the same manner. Now I know that my, uh, my hinges aren't working great. So you'll have to bear with me. I'm not positive that they're gonna look as good as I want them to. Put it on here. So first I'll cut the Top and bottom. Oh, 
you probably don't want to just watch the ground or my my hips. There we go. actually going to use the table saw for everything since my top saw is not cutting very square today. It's a brand new saw and I haven't had a chance to square it up in all, all the dimensions. I'm curious, Caitlin, at any point, are you going to talk about all your tools that you use to work with your tools? I am. I'm going to talk about <laughs> that a little bit in joinery. Uh, okay. So this wood shop is very expensive, and I don't want to um, talk too much about the specific means that I use to make my joinery, because not okay. everybody has access to all the tools that I have. Why didn't somebody tell me I forgot to put my hair up? <laughs> and drop that into a saw and it'll be a very exciting class. No, thought it was a fashion statement. <laughs> All right, so let me cut a couple of parts here and then uh, we'll see what we can do. So I've had an idea for this for a while, and I thought that it would it's going to work very similar to the, the bed that we just saw. Uh, but I've always wanted to do it to fit uh, one of those disposable igloo coolers, the, the styrofoam ones, because those take up so much space. Um, I even thought about using uh, rigid insulation foam on the inside so that it can break down and I don't have to worry about it. Uh, for the off season. Now I can hear what you're all thinking. Caitlin, for someone who's so safety conscious, shouldn't you have a guard on your saw? And the answer is yes. And now I hear you thinking, then why don't you? And the answer is because when I bought this saw, I was very young and very stupid. I basically got rid of them. Uh, let's see. So this has got to be. A 
also Caitlin. Yes. At some point, Vesta had a question about if you have suggestions for what hardware to use for SCA gear. I do, and we're coming up to that okay. in joinery. It'll be the last thing we talk about. Okay. But thank you for being on that for me. Yeah. Um, let's see, how do I want to do this? Safely and awesomely. Yeah. I need to take just a little bit off of this, and I don't want to do it by guess. Um, so this is going to be full length. And this is going to be, uh, okay. Sometimes you just have to do it and trust. Here's an adage. Never guess when you can measure, never measure when you can scribe. Scribe is putting two things together. Let's see how, uh, so I need to take the thickness of two of these off of a piece. And so what I'll do is take two pieces, which is the finished thickness that I need. Then I will frantically look for my pencil. There it is. And by putting those two thicknesses up there and scribing the line, I know that it is exactly the right size. I'll assume that I cut to the line. Now I'm going to be smart and clearly mark the bottom of the box top to avoid confusion. All right, that is what I needed to do. I will probably have. Smart girls use zero clearance inserts so that parts don't get sucked down in and shot back up into the face. All right. If you are a woodworker, you probably know that this piece of wood I'm putting in is spacer so that the offcut doesn't get trapped between the blade and the fence and shot back at a million miles an hour. <laughs> Everybody's pointing at my safety glasses, but I don't know where they're at, right? So I found them. Never mind. Stop looking. Let's see where I'm at. Okay, so now I just want to take this up here. All right, now I'll mark this bottom. I had to be taught again that uh, marking is critically important, especially when it comes to making dovetails. Because I cut a set of pins and then I cut a set of inverse tails and then I had to cut a new piece. In fact, uh, this piece is, uh, I cut the tails backwards. So the inside on one side of the box and the outside on the other. 
All right. Now I think I've, I think I've cut all the pieces correctly. I think I've cut all the pieces correctly. We'll see what happens. All right. You're all being very patient. So uh, some of the joinery that we that we use in the SDA, and I do not recommend, um, are not in that box, like I thought they were. That's very strange. I thought they were in there. Um, angle brackets, metal L-shaped brackets, these screw to both sides. They're never going to be square. They're never going to be very strong. Those are great for construction. They're terrible for what we're doing. Um, another one is the venerable butt joint. Uh, a butt joint is just two pieces coming together like that, and you nail through one side. Not particularly strong. Another one is, and you don't see this as much because it's difficult to do correctly, and I can guarantee you this one is not correctly, a miter joint, where the uh, sides are cut in an angle. Now you can nail through both sides, so you get a little more strength, but it's still not particularly strong. There are some other joints that I'm going to show you in a minute, but I've got to finish cutting them out because I know how much you love white community work. It's okay. I'm here for you. We do enjoy watching you work. <laughs> this is basically my entire childhood. I, I spent every Saturday watching PBS and watching all the Build It shows, uh, in particular, New Yankee Workshop, the Woodwright's shop, and of course, this old house. And I got a lot of, um, of my technique from there in terms of actual building uh, skills, construction skills, and not a small amount of knowledge. Let's see. No, that's not going to work. So I'm working at a very tiny scale, and what I wanted to do won't work on this scale exactly, but you'll get the idea. Should all my joiners going the right way? If you are going to put hinges on something, you almost always want to make sure that you've got really solid hinges. Uh, you can find lightweight hinges at hardware stores, and those really are not going to stand up to the work that we're doing, unless it's something like a jewelry box lid, uh, which is you know what it's designed for. The best hinge to use for applications where a hinge is appropriate is a piano hinge, also called a continuous hinge. Do I have those on here? I do. I don't think you guys can see. I really hate the uh, expansion joints on this floor. I don't know if y'all can see that cabinet. Oh, and that's not going to work. Okay. Uh, well, if you've ever seen the lid of a piano, that's a piano hinge. So here we've got the makings of a little chest. And we can add a little, sound like Bob Ross. 
Got a little chest here. Chest. A happy little chest. Happy little chest. And this little chest floor. Which I didn't measure for it. That's okay. Here we go. And chest lid. Now to get this to work, you would need to get uh, a 270 degree hinge, which means that for a, a 360 hinge, it might be a 360 hinge. See if I can make it work just for the process of demonstration here. The tape doesn't want to stick. So we've got a little chest here with the door, the top that opens, but it's got a secret. If the top folds all the way back and the bottom folds up, oops, and the hinges don't fall off. Remember what I said about using quality hinges and the sides can collapse. Then we've got something that folds flat for storage for the off season. And if you build out the edges a little bit to accommodate the thickness of insulation, you can build a very period looking cooler. And it doesn't have to be covered with blankets and towels and, ta and uh, tapestries, which everyone knows is hiding a cooler because nobody puts a tapestry over a thing in the middle of camp for no particular reason. Instead, it can be beautiful. So those are, those are concepts of what I mean by knockdown furniture. Uh, other knockdown furniture is stuff like um, bed bolts, uh, not bed bolts, sorry. Um, what are they called? One side has a steel plate with what looks like a keyhole, and the other side has a, a, a nut or a screw or something, and it fits into that keyhole and locks down. Uh, you've probably seen it on the back of clocks that hang on the wall. The, or a, a power strip has those, has a little keyhole shaped thing where the power strip goes over a screw and then pulls down to lock into place. Those are removable parts, but there's only two parts. You're not looking for the side, the front, a nut, a washer, a bolt, a wrench, another wrench to hold it straight. And only one person can build that at a time unless you've bought extra tools. Okay. So let's look at some of these other joints. Um, to finish cutting out this dovetail joint real quick. Actually, I'll save the dovetail joint. Uh, can someone help me? I can't remember the name. There was a Viking ship that was discovered um, and it had a tool chest in it, or it had a chest in it rather. Does anybody remember the name of that ship? It's very famous. Nobody? Vesta said Osberg. That's the oh, one. Thank you, Vesta. Thank you. Okay. So. And there was also the Master Mayor tool chest found. Yes, 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 thank you. So that chest used half lap joinery, which looks like this. Oh God, tell me I didn't cut this wrong again. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like butt joint, except you've got butt joints from two different sides. So to get that to stay in place, you have to nail it. And if you're going to nail in something that is fragile, which is basically everything that we're going to use, you need to pre-drill, especially if you're on the edge of a, uh, of a piece. If you don't want it to split out, you're going to have to pre-drill it. Huh. 
I never get to use this hammer. Someone bought it for me as a joke. Decorated it. And I have loved it. Got rhinestones and marabou fur. I don't know what you could possibly want more than that. All right, so we get a clamp. Probably not as much fun to watch the back of me, so I'm going to go ahead and move this over again so you can see me a little bit. Do I need to zoom in or is it okay there? Good? Okay. Yeah, that's good. Hmm. Yeah, I was smart. I thought I was. Yeah. Start with this guy. Grab my pens. Now, when I glue this, do y'all know what? Okay, never mind. Wood has end grain and uh, face grain, also edge grain, but they're basically the same thing as face grain. Imagine, uh, imagine a piece of wood as a big collection of straws all held together. So the ends of the straws are along the, the grain. And as you can imagine that those ends of the straws don't have a lot of surface area. So when you glue end grain to something, it's a very weak joint. When you grew end grain to face grain, it's still a very weak joint. It's only when you grew face grain to face grain that you have a strong joint. So in this one, if we're going to use glue, and we should, the only face grain we have are these two little shoulders right here where they come together. And so I'll go ahead and put a, a dab of glue there, because why not? Make sure I've got the insides on the inside. There we go. See. Well, now it's at the bottom. Anybody know how long your nail should be? <laughs> Not those nails, Crystal. Nails should be three times the thickness of the first material you go through. So one third of the nail should be in the material on top, two thirds of it should be buried in the other part. The nails I'm using are not long enough, but that's okay because we're not expecting this to stay long. And then we talked about the miter joint. And it's not a great joint. Um, it's pretty because you can't see the edges. Uh, but it's not particularly strong. It's good for picture frames because they just sit on the wall. And if you've got a CA furniture that just sits on a wall, I'm going to suggest that you probably don't actually have a CA furniture. Oh, right. So because it's cut on an angle, you have a little more glue surface, but it's not, this is a 45 degree, so it's a one-to-one -one rise over run. You know what that means? It's not until you get to like 12 to one that you're gaining strength. That is to say, for every unit uh, up you're going, you're going 12 units along. So if we were going to stick a two by four together, we wanted to glue them together to stretch that board, then for every inch of thickness of that wedge, we're going to go up a foot. I'm not sure if that was clear or not. It didn't sound particularly clear to me. See, this glue is not holding even here.
Oh, we'll put some nails for all the good it'll do. That split open on me. There's no mechanical advantage to this joint. This, by the way, is called a palm hammer. The best thing to use is a 10 or 15 pound fly, uh, free weight. You just hold it behind something when you've got a nail into it, and that way the shock is transferred into that and it doesn't just bounce all over the place on you. All right, that out. And I'm going to nail. I'm going to show you a trick for closing this gap up later. First, I've got to finish chiseling out this dovetail joint. I'm going to go ahead and this bench is my good one, so I try not to chisel directly onto this bench. So the dovetail joint is definitely the queen of all the joints. Um, it's beautiful, it's strong, it's, e it's not easy. It's, it's actually the measure of how good a woodworker you are, how tight your dovetail joints are. Mine are not particularly tight. When you remove waste, you remove a third of it at a time. Keep yourself from splitting it out. And after you cut the, your first cut is at 90 degrees to material. After that, you're gonna back bevel just a couple of degrees. Because remember, the end grain there doesn't have any structural ability. And that waste out. Now let's see how we did. Well, the good news is I seem to have cut them the right direction. Ooh, that's a good one. Note that with no nails, that's holding nice and sturdy. It does take skill, it does take time. On this back side, I just have a, a butt joint. Has anybody been snickering every, every time I say butt joint? Only Her Excellency. Hey! Really? What kind of chicken berry am I in? Well, <laughs> Vesta agreed. She was laughing too. Of course, Vesta did. I'm glad that you're here, Vesta. By the way, 
If you're going to use screws, which I definitely suggest because they are much stronger than nails, I don't trust nails at all, um, then a countersink is the thing to use, um, which I have on that drill right now. I'll demonstrate that in a minute. OK, so I've got this little square frame. And then I've got these two pieces that I've cross-lapped, like so. And they are going to fit. They are going to fit. They are Caitlin, Elena, Alva. They are going to fit after some quick surgery. I'm not sure how come they don't fit, but they don't. I'm just going to trim one piece down. I can find my tools. Which one of you stole my other pencil? Quick trip to the star. Forgot my safety glasses. Okay, so once I put this all together, and I've kind of mortised, or a, not a mortise, a uh, roof? Rabbit, rabbit. Cut a, no. Can't remember what that joint is called. Dado, I've cut a dado. D A D O, dado. In one side, just to illustrate, I was going to cut a, a haunched dado on the other side, but I didn't. So that we've got this going on. And then I will set the table saw. Grab all my safety equipment. Apparently there's an order they go in. A uh, point of table saw safety. Um, when I'm cutting along the grain, this is called uh, ripping. And when I cut across the grain, it's called cross cutting. Never, ever, ever use the rip fence for cross cutting. So what I've done is I put my block here again. I have set the distance and I'll use my uh, cross cut sled. Up against this block. And the reason is if you use the fence when you make this cut, particularly if the piece is longer than it is wide, it will bind. And when it, the when it does that, the distance between the blade and the fence becomes shorter than the length of the wood. This blade is spinning at, I think this particular one spins at something like four billion miles an hour. And it will launch this eighth inch piece of lumber as though it were a monomolecular shuriken and it will take me off at the waist. Okay, maybe not. But I do have a scar from when I had a kickback. And, uh, and so I learned that lesson. You can build a fence. You don't have to have anything that fancy. Crosscut sled is a brilliant thing and I strongly suggest it. 
All right. So the last step in our little torsion box here is to mark the internal dividers. If you were going to make a table like this, you would make many more of the internal divides. And they don't have to be uh, cross lap like these. Um, they could be staggered and screwed or nailed in. Oh, right. I'm marking. I'm getting ahead of myself. This is a tool that I do suggest you get no matter what level you're at. This is called a saddle square. Oops. And it is just a 90 degree piece of aluminum. And when I put it on one side, it transfers the, the measurement to the other side. It's made by a company called Veritas, which, if you know anything about snap-on tools, it's like the woodworking version of snap-on. Might as well be made out of gold for what you pay for it in terms of what it's worth, but you will never be sad that you spent the money on anything by Veritas. Until they get bought out by somebody. Okay, so now we're going to put a bead of good quality aliphatic woodworking glue like tight bond or gorilla. That's gorilla woodworking glue, not gorilla's regular foaming glue, which is good, but not for this application. Now, maybe you're worried about hitting your hands with a hammer. Here's the trick. Hold the nail upside down. You won't hit your hands. That's brilliant. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm only going to put a few nails in this because we're not doing it for real, but you'll get the idea. Doing this. Nobody just saw me hit my thumb. At this point, I think the majority of uh, people who are long-term skatians understand the physics involved in delivering a strong blow and heavy fight. Using a hammer is exactly the same. It's not the strength of my arm that's really doing the work. It's the multiplied force. So my shoulder is only moving about that much. My elbow, especially if I'm using a larger hammer, my shoulder is only moving that much. My elbow is moving a little bit more, but my wrist is throwing this head down. And I'm letting the weight of the tool do the work. And if I do it correctly, on this hammer is bent, so it's a little hard to do correctly. You should be able to set the nail and drive it in three hits, two if I'm doing well. Set, drive, finish, like that. Let me do the same thing on the other side. Now 
making sure that we get a good glue bond on the internals as well. If you were doing this for real, you'd also glue on the inside of this panel so that you have a good glue bond on both sides. I want you to notice that the butt joint has already failed. And that's because I'm going into end grain with both the nail and with the, the glue. There's just nothing for it to hold on to. Note for round two, have all my materials prepped. In my shop, everything is sharp, including the claws on my hammer. And that's so I can get at little brads like that. Then just pull that out. Start over. These nails, nails are called wire nails and they differentiate from cut nails. Cut nails, you will know because they are square. Section instead of round. Get rid of this cord because it's just bouncing around on me. So when this is done, it's lightweight. It's incredibly strong and rigid. It's pretty. Missed the board. Where could you use torsion box? What applications can you think of where this would be good? Because imagine how much this would weigh if it was solid. It weighs nothing. Unfortunately, the, uh, the computer is blocking the way into the kitchen, which is where my uh, food scale is, but it's light enough that that's what it would take to measure this. I'm guessing it's maybe three ounces. Imagine if this was made out of fur, right? Or if it was bigger. Um, these shelves are basically torsion boxes. I haven't put the bottom skins on, but once you can screw from the inside and they're, it's easily strong enough for me to climb on and walk around on. Or you, yes. Um, so yeah, where, what are some applications you can think of for a torsion box? I can imagine a, a table would be a, a great use for that. Yeah, absolutely. Nice, big, thick, heavy looking table. You can put uh, molding around the sides and make it look really fancy and it doesn't weigh anything. I have uh, several, in fact, I use them for SCA. I have several long conference tables. They're, uh, I think they're seven and a half feet long by 30 inches or 36 inches wide. Um, and you know those, you know, the folding metal legs. And if you've ever tried to carry one of those more than, I don't know, 20 feet, you know they weigh a ton. They're usually inch and a quarter particle board. 
which is made out of neutronium, I think. They're so <laughs> heavy. Uh, mine are three quarter by inch and a quarter. I want to say they're poplar all the way around, plus the internal structure. And then the voids are filled with that pink rigid insulation foam, blue over everything, an eighth inch skin on the top and an eighth inch skin on the bottom. They, I can carry those a hundred yards by myself and I'm not particularly strong. Plus I got to build the edges out with molding so they have a little lip so when the legs fold in, the legs are hidden. They fold, they, uh, they pack up nice. Um, I feel like I'm forgetting something. Let me check my notes. Angle plate nails, half lap, dub tap, miter dub. Oh, I was getting, oh, tusk tenons. We see those a lot. Uh, do you all know what a mortise and tenon joint is? For those of you who don't, it's a square or rectangular peg that goes through a square or rectangular hole. That's a tenon joint. It's a mortise and tenon. The mortise is the hole, the tenon is the peg. And then a tusk tenon, you've seen these in SCA furniture before. The tusk tenon comes through the, the, uh, the mortise and then it has a pin that goes on the inside. Um, I think, are Terracomarius thrones held together with those? They're garbage. Yep. They're, they're, yep. they're a period joint and they look good, but they're a pain in the ass. <laughs> If you're gonna, they wear out over time, especially on something like a throne. I'll bet those tusks are really loose, right? No. Not yet? Uh, Alt just remade the thrones, not oh, too okay. many. It won't take but a few years before those tusks get looser and looser and looser. By the way, uh, pro tip, attach the tusks to the tenon boards with a cord that way they're only six inches away and you don't have to go looking for them and like where did i put the where's my pencil where's my tenant or is where my tusk uh, because of the way we they work spare. what's that we have lots of spare oh yeah no dummy <laughs> cord everything no removable parts no removable parts will save you so much time i'm about a month and a half past when i was supposed to have glenduthan's thrones done but they won't have any removable parts at all. And they will set up in less than five seconds, literally less than five seconds. Because they're all hinges. Um, they're all designed to use the strength of the material and not the strength of the hinge. Uh, they fold up super flat. They, so they're down in less than three seconds and set up in less than five. And they're lightweight and they're gorgeous. And they're all in my head right now. So uh, I'm, I'm looking at the joints yeah. of your books, and they they all look so precise. Do you have any tips on getting them that precise, other than spending a fortune on uh, such nice equipment? Several. Um, well, okay, so. There was a person in my life that taught me a lot about woodwork and it's unfortunate because that person turned out to be really bad for me. Um, but I can't argue that the things that he taught me were valuable things. One of them was start square, end square. Invest in a good quality square. Um, I have a couple. You saw the, the sound square that I used. This is a decent uh, speed square. These are great. This one is called a guaranteed square. It's made out of titanium. It was expensive, but if I'm gonna spend my money on something, it's gonna be my layout tools. Because my if my layout lines are accurate, then trying to get everything else accurate is just a matter of practice. I'm gonna show you a trick on the miter joint. All right. So, let's see if I've got a burnisher here. What should I do? This will work. 
you can all see that there's a gap in that joint where the two pieces come together. And take a burnisher, which is any hard round thing. Rub the edge of the joint. Assuming that I had set my nails. Oh, well, see, this was aluminum, and so it's marked the, the wood up, and it looks worse than when I started. And the only sandpaper I have is nine grit. All I did was rub that corner and it closes it up. Um, for any of the fine joinery, the start square and square, you can never have enough clamps. Always clamp your work down to a table while you're working. I should have been doing it the entire time and I just, I don't, hey, 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 get back in here. The cat is going for an adventure. Hey. Excuse me, I'll be right back. <laughs> you know better than that. Making me look better. No kidding. <laughs> no kidding. There's a furniture maker called Frank Klaus, uh, who is a, a, an incredible master, particularly of dovetail joints. Uh, his dovetail joints, you can pick them out anywhere. They're hugely wide. They're this giant angle. Um, and what he says, and I agree with him, because I'm definitely one to criticize master woodworkers, uh, is that the, the most important skill in hand cut woodworking, or even I guess machine woodworking too, is the, the ability to cut to a line, particularly to split a line. If you cut a, make a pencil line, um, then the ability to cut on half of that pencil line is huge. Um, somewhere in here, I have a marking knife, which is also something very useful for what we're doing. Hello, little one. But uh, I put it someplace where I don't know where it is. A marking knife uh, is a knife that's beveled just on one side. And so when you drag it along your straight edge, the, the mark that it leaves is flush right up against the straight edge. It doesn't wander at all. Most of the work that you're going to do in SCA stuff, it just doesn't matter if it's off by a few sixty fourths. You know, uh, if you're building a house and you're out by a quarter of an inch, you're fine. If you're building jewelry boxes and picture frames, a few sixty fourths of an inch is a ruined project. Hello, little one. Um, the these type of quick clamps are are wonderful. Irwin is the is the go-to company for these. Um, they open and close very quickly and then use the trigger to clamp them down. A selection of these is great for projects basically about the size of this workbench. Bigger than that you want a pipe clamp or a K-body clamp. Um, Yeah, I think those are the, the real tricks to, to getting tight joinery. If I had failed on this dovetail joint, which it's okay, but it's not great. Let's take a look at, I'm gonna draw an arrow. This joint right here. It's not quite the tight, as tight as I would like it to be. So what I would do is clamp my work. Grab my dovetail saw. And go ahead and crook into there. Now the question is, do I have any veneer anywhere? I think it's all downstairs. Do 
you can buy what's called paper veneer, which is sheets of wood, basically the thickness of paper. I'm just going to make some real quick. Yeah, I remember the order this time. Lock my threads down. And actually, not that. I want to use the same material that I am. Building the product out of. Is right there where I left it. So this is my marking knife. There we go. There's the light. So that's the flat side, and it's beveled on that side. So when I scribe a line, it's right up next to it. Apparently my carving knife is not as sharp as I want it to be. So I put that veneer in at an angle. And if I were doing this for real, and I have many, many times, I would um, make sure I got some glue in there too. What are you doing? The cat's on top of a door where you can't see her. As cats do. Yeah, I think she's trying to get into the rafters. As cats do. I don't know if you can see that or not. There we go. Now that gap is totally gone. So there's a there's a hint for that. Uh, if you've got other stuff where you've cut a joint and it's not quite right, I am going to strongly suggest. Um, let's see, did I, I think I've covered everything. Uh, are there questions outstanding? Did I get Vesta's question? Did I answer that, Vesta? Oh, I was gonna show you countersinking for screws. Got the right countersink, I do. 
She said, yep, and that she looked up Piano Hinge. Oh, good, good, good. Um, oh, uh, you guys, Miller Dolls, too. One of the participants said they have to leave, but thank you very much for a nice class. Thank you for sticking through it. Can you see your cat? So um, you may have experienced this before. I did that wrong. Try to put a screw into something. And it splits. You see the split in there? So the way to fix that is to countersink it. Pre-drill and countersink. My countersink has uh, a drill bit and then also a bevel on it that cuts. I'm going to do this one on the edge too, so you can see I'm doing the same thing on both. doing? She's trying to steal the show. That's doing a pretty good job of it. I didn't countersink quite enough and my drill bit's a little small for that so I've got a little splitting there too but I've got the screw uh, basically flush to the to the material and that's the trick. You really want that screw head to be flush. Mine's a little bit proud still. And the reason is anywhere past the material that the head of the screw goes is not holding wood. If it's buried down deep inside, it's not holding the wood anymore. You've just basically made the wood. So if it was a piece of three quarter inch lumber and you buried the screw head an eighth of an inch down, you've now got five eighths inch lumber instead of three quarter. Um, there was something I was going to show you. Oh, yeah, Miller dolls. So these are a neat way to do things. I'm just going to kind of rip this up. I don't know how I'm going to rip this up. These have a, uh, these could pass for a period look, but they are highly engineered fasteners. They're not particularly expensive. It, uh, when you buy the set, it comes with a very special drill bit, which I'll show you in a second, that matches these pins. I forgot I'd cut that side.
Sorry, I've got my back to you for this part. <laughs> Can you see those two pins? The two circles there, here and here. So that's totally flush because I cut them off. This is a Miller dowel. It's a hardwood dowel that's stepped. It's got these grooves in it for glue. I should have glued it when I did it. Um, they're middling price. You wouldn't want to do the whole thing you wouldn't want to build a house out of it or anything. Um, they come in different sizes. These are the smallest size. I have some bigger ones that are three inches long or so. Um, but they end up looking like you've pegged the joint, even though it's a really strong glue joint. The drill bit is designed so that it works like a nail. Um, and it does come, it, since the top end is wider, I don't know if you can see this, top end is, top end is wider, it, uh, it has the effect of like a nail head getting uh, this down. I drill one straight in, which is not particularly strong, although I'm gonna have face grain to face grain because of the way the, the uh, edge grain is. Um, and then I drill one at an angle. And if I drill them both at an angle, then it's got a mechanical lock that won't let it come out. But here's the neatest thing about a Miller drill or a Miller dowel. Let's say I've got a, a uh, miter joint, right? And so I'm screwing in from, what are you? Um, if I was doing some screws and I go to drill and I accidentally hit my screw, I ruin the drill bit. But with Miller dowel, I'm just drilling through a dowel. Just wood. Hey, Caitlin, we had two questions in chat. All right, let me. Uh... Whenever you're ready. The wrong kind of saw to do that kind of cut. That dowel, you can see on the back side, is going through that dowel. And it's actually just locking this one in place. It can't move out now. It's a really clever way of doing it. Uh, Krista, what are, my, what are my chat questions? Uh, the first one, um, have you tried horseshoe nails? Um, are, are horseshoe nails the, like saddle nails, the kind that you use to um, hold conduit, or uh, not conduit, but uh, cable down? Is that the same thing? I think. Just a second. See my little weirdo here. Sorry. <laughs> she, what is she doing? Cat break while we think about nails. Uh, the actual, no, the actual nails for horseshoes. Oh, 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 oh. I just, I just looked them up and they do, they are square uh, and they come in different legs and uh, <laughs> that. There was a lot have, of very square ones. I have not used uh, nails that were specifically for horseshoeing. I have used cut nails before, which are a square cross section. Um, generally, they're flat on two sides and then beveled towards each other on the other side. Uh, the trick with those is that you always have to align the 
flat sides with the grain. Otherwise you split the grain open like a wedge. Uh, those are wonderful. And when I find them, I pull them out and old timers who have jars of nails, those are the kinds that you keep because they're soft to iron. You can hammer them back out straight and use them again. And they're as good as they ever were. Awesome. Yes. Um, let's see. And uh, an another person asked, um, why not use glue and a dowel? Oh, absolutely. You should use glue and a dowel. I was being fast and loose okay. with it. Uh, definitely use the, the, use the glue in the dowel as well. Uh, unless, so aliphatic wood glue, um, I don't know if it still does or not, but for a long time it used blood as its uh, thickening agent because it coagulates. Blood coagulates really well. And so they render down, uh, generally it's horse or cattle blood. And so if you don't want that in your project, that might be a reason why not to use uh, use wood glue. Sorry, I'm just digesting the random glue facts that were shocking. Hide glue is not as used as uh, predominantly as it used to be. Um, hide glue is a different kind of glue that has to be warmed up to use, but it's a fantastic adhesive. It's just, you know, has an unfortunate necessity to use the hides of the animals that had been previously using them. Yeah. Um, another question is modern hot glue, good or bad? Totally depends on the application. Uh, I, if, if you need to stick something together that's not gonna be structural um, and you need to do it in a hurry, hot glue is fantastic. Uh, if you need it to hold something together over a long period of time, especially something that's going to be handled, and we're going to assume that any SCA furniture is definitely going to be handled, then it's probably not your best shot. It is, however, remarkably good for holding two pieces together while you put a real fastener in it. I could uh, talk all day about things like sharpening, uh, fixing woodwork mistakes, those are, uh, those are topics that are absolutely fascinating to only people who are really into woodworking. So I won't bore you with those sorts of things. I will tell you, I saw a fantastic demonstration of sharpening using a block of mozzarella as the material because it has fibers. Hey. She's chasing birds. I'm gonna have, she's not supposed to be in the yard. Adorable. I might have to go get her. That's, that's fair. Lita. Lita. Nah, no, she's not paying attention. Anything else? Anything else at all I can answer? Oh, 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 I know what I was going to tell you. How to use a saw without being frustrated. Uh, let's see. How can I set this up so you can see what I'm doing? I can do it on this side. While you're doing that, Vesta says, uh, that she has to go to sleep, but thank you for answering all the questions. You're so welcome, Vesta. I miss you and I hope we see you soon. I don't know if you saw the, uh, the invite, but my birthday's coming up. Also, yeah, you should all go to her birthday. Okay. So, so everyone has tried to cut a two by four or something and it gets bound up and is frustrating, yeah? Let me teach you the, the secrets of using a saw. Uh, first off, different saws are for different things. This particular one is a cross-cut saw. They intend to cut across the grain. Uh, there are rip saws as well. And the difference in those is a cross-cut saw, if you looked at its teeth really close up, it would look like a series of chisels all put together. I'm sorry, like a series of knives all put next to each other. Um, a, a rip saw looks like a series of chisels. So they do different things. Generally, you're cross cutting. So let's look at cross cutting. What's important to know right now is that uh, the front edge of where the teeth are is called the toe and the back edge is called the heel. 
when I cut, first off, here's a trick to know if your uh, saw is uh, vertical, take a look at the reflection. If you can see where I'm at, look at the reflection in the saw. And if the reflection makes it look like the piece is going straight through, uh, then you are 90 degrees. Second thing you need to do is you need to get body alignment. Um, I need my wrist, my elbow, and my shoulder all in one plane. So right now I'm way too far over. I've got to move my body so that my wrist, my shoulder, or my, this is called my elbow, and my shoulder are all on the same plane. Then when I go to cut, I'm using my other hand to brace the saw once I get it at the right angle. And I'm going to adjust my body as many times as I need it. When I go to cut, I'm going to lift on the toe. Um, and so if my, if my toe's down, well, that's not going to stay, is it? No, whatever, we'll make it work. If, my, if I've got too much on the toe, it'll grab. If I've got it on the heel, then I can run through. It's OK to do a starting cut by pulling backwards. I need another clamp. This is not going to work. Oh, look at this. Yeah. This is called a bench hook. And it's meant for just this purpose. The clamp is extra. I don't actually need it. But Every stroke, I'm lifting up on the toe just a little bit. And that's how that's done. It's a nice, clean cut. My angle's a little off, about three degrees. So you can see that the angle's off when I twist this part around. It multiplies the angle of the cut. I don't know, can you see that it, it kind of goes around a corner? And then if I look at it here, oh, I did pretty good. That's pretty 90 degree cut. It's not tipped either direction. That is how to use a handsaw and not get frustrated with it. Y'all want to see some tricks with a hammer? For my next trick, I'm going to use a claw hammer instead of my rip hammer. Before you start that, there's two people that said that they needed to go to bed. And they oh, said, yeah, thank yeah. you for a wonderful class. They had, dis they had dishes to do before bed. And thank you for a wonderful class. They need to get ready for bed. We're in the bonus section now. So everything here is just gravy. OK. Hello, people. Welcome to the icing. We like gravy. This is a, a rip hammer. This is a claw hammer. You can see the difference in the way that the, the shapes are. This is for demolition and this is for construction. So I'm going to use my, use my claw hammer for this one. Hammer face, hammer body, hammer claws, uh, sorry, hammer head, hammer face. Hammer cheek is this edge. And we're going to use the edge. Now, most people use drill now and screw, so you're not using a, not using nails as much anymore. But if you are, imagine that I am standing right now at the top of a ladder. Uh, I can't get to there. Uh, and I just, I can't lean back very far. And I want to, I want to put a nail here, but I'm on a ladder and I, I want to hang on with one hand. Yeah. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to hold the, the hammer this way. 
and then we're going to grab the nail with the head up against the cheek. And then with one hand, I'm going to hang on to my work and the other hand, put the nail in. But maybe I'm up on top of a ladder and I want to put something up way up high. So what I'm going to do, oh, uh, it's not going to work with this one. These nails are too small. I just pulled a bunch of nails out, so you never know. I might have one on the ground. Okay, I don't know if this is going to work or not because this uh, this nail looks pretty bent, but we'll see what happens. I'm going to lock the nail into the hammer like this. Now I've got it between the claws with the point going backwards. There we go. Now I'm on top of the ladder. Oh, you're making me look bad, Hammer. I don't think I can do it with this one because the, the claws just aren't wide or too wide now. I can't get it. But you get the idea. The nail is stuck in here with the head of it up against the base of the hammer. And I throw the hand this way once, boom, and then flip around and I can drive it again. And remember, I'm using the, the action of my wrist, shoulder and elbow all together to drive that, that nail in. I'm not trying to push it. I'm throwing the hammer at it. Trying to hit the nail on the first time. Generally, if you look at the nail, that's what you'll hit. All right, those are my nail tricks. And then one last bonus saw trick. Distin. Distin Brothers saw, this is my saw. These are called horns. Anybody know what they're for? Besides being ergonomic. So we know that we normally care holding the saw this way. These horns are so you can hold it in a different way. You can hold it this way. And you use that to saw up to a ceiling. You can put your hand inside to saw through a floor. Uh, there's one more, I'm trying to remember what it is. Nope, that's it, I can't remember that one. So that's it, those are your, those are your bonus tips, saw and hammer tips. And if you ever get a chance to use a bit and brace, these are the most fun tools in the entire world. The, the way the tips work is they have a threaded end on them. So when you are boring a hole, uh, you can actually count the number of turns and it will always go the same depth through the material. So you can drill a stopped hole by hand and they go really fast. My bits are somewhere and I don't know exactly where, so I can't show that to you, but. It's one of my most favorite things in the world. The bit and brace? Yes. Well, like... Yeah, they're, they're wonderful. There's a number of different kinds of bits that you can use with them. I don't, I only have auger bits. I don't have any spoon bits, unfortunately. Um, that, that a spoon bit will cut a rounded bottom hole. Uh, but unlike my electric drill, even though it's battery operated, which means I can leave the house to use it, I can only use it for so long before the battery drives. With that bit and brace, I just need more food. In addition, uh, this is an older, or this is a newer style, obviously, they, um, I 
can get it. A ratchet. So this actually will get into places that this one can't. If I want to get right up in there, I can. It takes forever, but I can do it. So that's the thing to look out for. And these, these are cheap at secondhand stores. They're stupid cheap. Also flea markets and estate sales. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. We could talk about hand planes and hand planes versus planers, joiners versus joinery planes and so forth, wood body versus metal body at some point. There's all kinds of nerdery we could get into, but for right now, I think that's a probably a pretty good place to stop. So uh, thank you. This has been the Boat Ride Stop. This is not a product of WKE or W, is it? WKEB in Boston? QEB, Q, WQED in Boston. This is not a production of WQED in Boston. We are not founded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, although we should be. Somebody should get me in the divorce. Uh, <laughs> we are not a product of OPB or public broadcasting station, although we should be. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. This has been great. Um, and thank you, Krista, for being a lovely assistant much better than uh, the Baron and Baroness who <laughs> so thank you, thank you. But uh, yeah. You were eating, you needed to get food in your face. You're busy being Baron. <laughs> <clears throat> and then listening to, uh, uh, I'm glad we, we have the ability to mute because there's a lot of yelling at the child to get ready for <laughs> Um, yeah, it's been a great class. Hold on.